But as far as this study of the Gospels, we'll be finishing up this week. And as we finish, we're titled this message, Following Jesus. Following Jesus. And I've got three different scripture references that we're going to pull from. Because I had these references that I was going to pull from. And then I had a list of ten ways that we know that we're following Jesus. But after looking through the ten verses and studying through these, or looking through these three stories that we're going to be looking at, uh, we probably would have been here at least an hour just going over that part. So I, I cut it down for you all so you don't have to worry about that. I know there's a cartoon football game going on that most of you are missing right now to be here. So I thank you for being here and not watching that, that football game. Uh, and so we're going to be talking about three different stories that I've titled The Soul Called and Everything. The Soul Called and Everything. And realistically, I could have interchanged these titles, and actually I did a couple different times trying to figure out the best way to describe these in a word or two. And I found it really difficult because I was just going to call the whole thing called because that's really what this is about. When we choose to follow Jesus, we're not just following Jesus, we are called to Jesus. Notice when we talk about the 12 disciples, each of the disciples that Jesus picked, he called. This flies in the face of the Jewish tradition of the student picking the teacher. Here, the teacher is picking the student. And so in this aspect, we are all called to Jesus, and we all have a calling. And I know that may be a strange thing, because we think, oh, a well, calling, that must be like being in ministry, or, or being part of the kids program, or or going off and serving in Africa somewhere, because all missionaries serve in Africa, right? That was a little bit of a joke. Our mission field is anything outside these walls. Our ministries are anything that we take part in outside of these walls. Regardless of our job, regardless of our hobbies, regardless of anything we do, we can do those things for God. And we should be doing those things for God. Because I can guarantee you my hobbies are different than your hobbies. The people I meet because of my hobbies will be different than the people you meet because of your hobbies. My job is a little bit different than all of your jobs, but we all have different jobs as well. And we all meet different people because of those jobs. Thankfully. Thankfully, you're not surrounded by the same people all the time. Because I'm pretty sure we'd get a little bit tired of, or the people around us then would really start getting tired of all the things we'd have to say. But we're all in different spheres of influence. We're all in different groups. We're all in different hobbies. We're all in different professions. So we can take the gospel. We can take following Jesus into those circles. That's what we are designed to do. That's what we are called to do. And that's what we're talking about this morning. And so our first story comes from Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 through 26. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own life, or you must give up your own way. Take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your own life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? Oftentimes we, we read this verse and we think, yeah, we all have to sacrifice ourselves and, and take up our cross and, and follow Jesus. But when does Jesus tell his disciples this? Jesus is telling his disciples to take up their own cross before Jesus has taken up the cross himself. They have no understanding of how Jesus is going to die. They have no understanding of the pain and torment that he is going to go through. The only thing they know is about crucifixion when it comes to crosses. And so the disciples' eyes are kind of opened by this, and they have to realize what Jesus is saying. And the rest of these stories will go on to explain this. What does it mean to take up your own cross? Does that mean to take on the personality of saying, oh, woe is me. I have to be in pain. I have to be in agony. I have to be in torment all the time for Jesus. No. That's not what that's saying. But what it is saying is saying, cling to Jesus, as Jesus would later cling to that cross. Jesus never denied anything that any of the Pharisees or any of the men of the law brought against Jesus. He never complained. He never tormented any of them. He never said anything bad against any of them. But yet he willingly embraced the cross. He willingly 
went to the cross. He in the Garden of Gethsemane said, not my will, but your will. This is what Jesus is pointing to. He is pointing that we take up God's will for our life, not our own. Because it says here, then Jesus says, if any of you wants to be my disciples, you must give up your own way, just as Jesus would later give up his own way. We talked a little bit about this morning in Sunday school, is we don't like to think about the future. We don't like to think about, especially when it comes to death. Nobody likes to think about that. Nobody likes to think about a life coming to the end. But that's when we're promised heaven. So the thing that we as Christians should be anticipating the most is one of the things that we necessarily don't want to think about the most. And so it's often like we keep Jesus or we keep heaven or we keep God at an arm's distance away from us. Because that's, that's for later. That's not for now. Or that's not for, that's not for this moment. That's for, that's for when my life comes to an end. I've got a while yet. And so it becomes easy to do that. We kind of fall into that lacks of faith that we talked about last week. Oh, well, heaven's not, not close yet. Or God's not coming back yet. Or Jesus isn't coming back yet. Or I've still got time, so I can, I can maybe do this a little bit. This sin isn't too bad. Let me fall into this just a little bit. I can, I can turn around and come back if I want to. Before I go off on too much of a rant, I'll keep going here. If you give up your life for my sake, this isn't saying that if you die for me, then you'll have eternal life. This isn't saying that we have to die. I mean, eventually we'll get there. So yes, eventually we all have to die. But it's saying if you live your life for me, not just giving up life, but every aspect of our life, as I talked about earlier, if you live every aspect of your life for me, then you will save your life. Then you will have eternal life because you chose me over choosing this world. So what's this mean in a practical manner? And Jesus talks about this here. We get to see this kind of played out in Luke uh, chapter 9 here, verses 57 through 62. As they were walking along, someone said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. But Jesus replied, foxes have dens to live in, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to even lay his head. This is one of those times where someone chose to want to follow Jesus. They wanted to be one of the disciples. They wanted to be one of those 12. And Jesus said, are you ready for what that means? Are you prepared for what that entails? Because foxes have their homes. Birds have their homes. All of the animals in the world have places to go. You right now have a place to go. You have a place to call your home. If you follow me, that means giving that up. That means giving up your comfort. It means giving up your security. It means giving up whatever it is that is keeping you from following Jesus. And he goes on a little bit further into this. Because Jesus then asked this person, come, follow me. And the man agreed, but he said, first let me go home and bury my father. But Jesus told him, let the spiritually dead bury their own dead. Your duty is to go and preach about the kingdom of God. Now what, what is happening here? Jesus is saying that this man can't go home first and bury the dead. Well, one, it looks like they weren't Jewish people to begin with. They weren't of the Jewish background. And it doesn't look like they knew anything about Jesus either. And so Jesus is basically saying, you have nothing left back there. There's nothing for you there that will benefit you there. And if you go back to that place, you won't come back. You won't come to me. You won't seek me. And I think many of us here today have that place. Have a place that if we return to, it's kind of a no man's land. It's that comfort area. Or it's that spiritually dead area. It's where the world feels a little bit more comfortable than it feels with Jesus. And we've all been to that place because Jesus is saying, there's nothing for you here. We all have that one place that if we fall back into it, Jesus knows we'll have a hard time coming back out of it. And it's important that we identify that. It's important that we identify where we've come from, how far we've come. 
I know most of us like to see that, oh, well, life's just like this. Like we're getting closer and closer to God. But that's wishful thinking, isn't it? Life isn't always a straight up general line straight to God. It's peaks and it's valleys. Oftentimes it seems like more valleys than, than peaks, really. It seems like, you know, the last, over the summer, summer was busy, wasn't it? And then we get into the fall season. I'm like, oh, well, fall, school will start, things will slow down, things will get back to normal, and, and it'll be good because we'll have a little bit more time. Well, no, school started, and then the schedule changed, and then we all had to get used to the schedule changing. And then, well, now there's, now it's October, and we have the light the night at the end of this month, and we have carrying meals, and then we have the women's group, and then we have, you know, Thanksgiving starting up, and then we have speakers coming in November, and then we have a speaker coming in December, and then we have another speaker in December, and then, you know, we have, oh, well, we have Thanksgiving, too, on top of that, and then we have all the Christmas seasons. Oh, and then Christmas Eve is on Sunday, so then we have a Sunday service plus Christmas Eve service. It, it's fall, and things haven't slowed down. Maybe, maybe after the new year, maybe after the new year, things will slow down, won't it? Well, no, because then after the new year, we'll be trying to figure out the new theme for the year. At least I'll be trying to figure out the new theme for the year. And then once I get the theme for the year figured out, I'll have to plan out the schedule. And then all of a sudden, Easter will be here, and then we'll have Easter, and then we'll have spring. And we'll have to plan all the spring events that we'll be able to do outside because it was a long winter and cold winter. And so we'll be excited about getting outside. And then all of a sudden, summer will be here, and we'll be back to that business of summer. But wait, that was the full year, and nothing slowed down. Life doesn't slow down. How do we interact with that life that we've been given, though? How do we make sure we don't fall back into that place that we can't go to? How do we make sure we don't fall back into that place? Another said, yes, Lord, I will follow you, but first let me say goodbye to my family. But Jesus said to him, anyone who puts a hand to the plow and then looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. Once again, Jesus is saying, don't go back. Don't go back to what you know. Because I am not part of what you knew. Let me be a part of what you know now. Let me change everything you think you know. And that's what Jesus was all about. Even the Pharisees, Jesus was the people who should have known the best about Jesus and about Jesus' teachings and about the flipping of the world that was taking place, they had no idea. They had no idea what was going on. Now, when I read this story, and hopefully when you read this story, you're taken back to another story that happens in the Old Testament. And so when a man named Elisha meets a man named Elijah, and Elijah, Elijah, Elisha is called by Elijah to follow Elijah. But Elisha says to Elijah, let me go back. Let me say goodbye to my family. And so Elisha goes back to his family. He goes back to the plow that he was just pushing. And he says goodbye to all of them. But yet he doesn't just say goodbye. He slaughters the oxen that was pulling the plow. He breaks down the plow that he was using, and he sets the plow on fire, and then uses that plow, he, or then uses the oxen that was just killed as a sacrifice. And then after that sacrifice, he used that as a feast for his family. But why? Because Elijah destroyed everything that was keeping him from following Elijah. If we translate the name Elijah, it is God with me. Or me a part of God, if we put it that way. To follow God, Elisha knew he had to destroy everything that was keeping him from going. Had to sacrifice everything that was in his way. What is keeping us from fully committing to Jesus? And I'm not saying we have to go and destroy all of our animals. I'm not saying we have to go sacrifice those. I'm not saying that we have to leave behind everything. I'm not saying it's bad to have a place to rest our heads. It's not bad to have a home. We all don't have to be traveling missionaries. But what Jesus is asking, I want us to point out the fact that every time 
Jesus has met with one of these people, every time one of these people comes up and says, I will follow you, Jesus wants to make sure that they know 100% what they're going to have to sacrifice in order to follow him. Because if your faith hasn't cost you anything yet, it will. Or is it really your faith? Or are you simply playing faith? Because also I was thinking about this this week and I was like, what has, what has my faith, what has our faith as a family, what has it cost us? And I remember when we first moved to Berlin, because we lived in Berlin for some reason, everything closed down at five, six o'clock. And so I'd get off work from Canton and then I'd drive back home and it'd be five or six o'clock and I'd ask Crystal, where do you want to go eat? Oh, wait, we can't go eat anywhere. We lived in Canton, which if you look at it statistically, has like the highest restaurant to person (laughs) ratio in most of the United States. Like if there's a restaurant that's not in Canton, then it probably doesn't exist. Like we left that. We left being able to go out and eat whenever we wanted to, to move to Berlin. We left what was fairly comfortable. Sure, I was working six days a week, 12 hours a day. But it meant during the winters, we could do whatever we wanted. It meant Krista could have a part-time job. That was like my biggest goal. Like, I want a job where I can support the family, and Krista could stay home with the kids, and, you know, maybe we could even homeschool. Yeah, no, we we can't homeschool because once we had our first kid, and then once they got into school, we realized they're not the homeschooling kid type. It takes a special kid for homeschool, but I think it takes a even more special parent for homeschooling too. So we are not not that type of family. And then what did our faith cost us? Well, then we started getting into this whole ministry thing. And I had a job working at a hardware store, and we were talking. It's like, after three years of being here, this is the second longest continuous job that I've had since I've got into working. I was at the hardware store for four years, then I was at the retirement home for a year and a half, and then I waited tables for three months, and then I got into youth ministry. But it's like I had insurance. I had a retirement plan. I keep getting calls from the retirement company saying, hey, what are you going to do with this money? So we have to figure that part out. But you see, we had that security blanket. And when we first got to the church that we got to in Millersburg, we realized we wanted to do something different. We realized we weren't doing faith the way it should be done. And notice I keep saying faith, I don't say religion. Because religion and faith are completely different things. They just sound a lot alike. And that's another story for another time that I can get into. But we first told the minister when we first got to Millersburg, how can we serve the church? And that's how I got myself into working with third to fifth graders, which I am not good with third to fifth graders, so I don't know how I got there. I did not want to be there, but I ended up there, so I said, okay. And I told the minister, because he kept asking me, hey, Josh, do you want to try this? Do you want to do this? Would you help us with this? And every time I would say yes. He was always confused why I never asked any other questions on when or where or why or how or anything else. I just constantly said yes. Because I told him, if it involved the church, if it involved the plan of furthering the kingdom for God, I will always say yes. That's how I later got into leading the VBS at Millersburg. That's how I later got into doing my first communion meditation, my first speaking appearance in front of people, in front of almost 450 people. The first time I've ever spoken in front of a crowd was 450 people. Yeah, that wasn't fun. That's not what I wanted to do. But I knew I had to keep saying yes. I had to keep pushing myself out of my comfort zone. I had to keep making sure that my faith was being lived out and wasn't being stifled by my own limitations. Because I don't know about you, but I can put the greatest limitations on myself. If I simply just said no, if I stayed comfortable, Would that mean I grew as a person? And that brings me to the next point of growth or growing, which is going to be the theme of next year, growth. Not only how do we 
grow individually, but how do we grow together? How do we become stronger together? And how do we make sure that the church that's been around for over 150 years continues into the next 150 years? That's our theme of next year, so I'll let that settle. And I'll let that go into when it's supposed to. But what has your faith cost you? I remember when I decided to hand everything over to God, and I was like, you know what? I'm going to go into wait tables. Jesus was a servant. Let me try this whole service thing. And I was scared to death because I told my dad, I've, I've got a new job. I'll be, I'll be working at a restaurant. I, was, I hope it's not waiting tables. <laughs> Funny you should say that because that's exactly what I'm doing. And it made me even more terrified because I think a week later we found out we were pregnant with Harper. I was like, how do we do this now? <laughs> I've got a baby on the way and I'm waiting tables. Three months after that, a church calls me and says, hey, Josh, we've been in talk with your minister. We might have a position for you. And I said, yes. Don't you want to know any details? Okay, maybe. <laughs> maybe knowing details for a job would be nice. So we got details. And I was working at the restaurant, and I was going to start, you know, part-time as a youth minister. And then all of a sudden, I had a heart attack. But, but why? I'm making good money at the restaurant. I can make good money. In the, well, I can make money at <laughs> youth ministry. Like, this could, this could work. I can, I can do both, and I can still be okay. God said, no, you can't. God said, I don't want part of you in ministry. I want all of you in ministry. Because there's no such thing as part-time ministry. And it doesn't matter what walk of life you're in. You're all in ministry. And it's not a part-time thing. It's a full-time thing. And so because of my heart issue, I gave up the restaurant and said, okay. I'll do this regardless of whatever it says. Full-time, part-time, half-time, no time. I'm in this and I'm saying yes to whatever God has for me. A year and a half later, get a phone call that says, hey, can you help us with the opening of the church after COVID? I said, yes, I'll be there. Three years later, I, you haven't kicked me out yet, so I guess I'm still here. It's not the easiest thing in the world. Yes, it's fairly comfortable. Just don't check under my shirt because I'm still sweating because I'm still nervous about doing this whole thing. It's cost us. It's cost Krista. It's cost me. It's cost the girls. But the blessings from those costs far outweigh anything that those costs have called for us to give. Every time we are called to give, we give. But the blessings that return are so much greater, are so much greater. And I pray if there's nothing else that we see that this morning, that regardless of whatever your faith has cost you, regardless of whatever your faith will cost you, the blessings that return back to you will be so much greater, regardless if we see it in this lifetime or the next lifetime. I don't plan on being in this life for a long time but I plan on making sure that this life is a good time for my wife, for my family, and for as many people as I come in contact with. I may be that extremely awkward guy who sees a person and smiles in the store and then realizes you weren't smiling back at me. Or if I see someone wave, I will wave back even if you were waving to the third person behind me. Even if I'm reading a book and you walk up and say, hey, that's a really good book, and I say thank you as if I wrote it, I will continue to smile afterward because I am awkward, but I will try my best to put on a happy face. Because despite what this world has to throw at us, we serve a God who is so much greater. So much greater than any awkwardness, than any isolation, than any desperation, than any depression, than any anxiety. Our God is greater than all of that. And that brings us to our last story of everything. Of what are we willing to give up? This comes from Mark chapter 10, verses 17 through 27. 
And I know most of you know this story. As Jesus was starting out on his way to Jerusalem, a man came running up to him, knelt down and asked, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus asked. Only God is truly good. Now verse 18 here may sound a little little confusing and maybe Jesus was a little caught up in his feelings in that moment of humanity. Maybe he had a rough night's sleep or something or maybe his back was a little stiff and he didn't feel all that, all that good. But he realizes that this man isn't necessarily putting God in the place that God should be. So this here might be strike one against this rich young ruler as some titles here have it. Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So Jesus already knows that maybe this man is praising Jesus more than he is praising God. That's why this is phrased this way, and maybe that might be strike one against this young man here. But to answer your question, you know the commandments. You must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. You must not cheat anyone. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, the man replied, I've obeyed all these commandments since I was young. Let's look back at these, though. You must not murder. No one in here, I believe, has murdered anyone, so we're okay there. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. You must not cheat anyone. Honor your father and mother. Hopefully all of us know these. Hopefully all of us can see that these are pretty important things to understand. If I brought Brinley out here, hopefully, I know how she is with some of my questions sometimes, but hopefully if I brought Brinley out here and I asked her, is it okay to murder? She would say, no. Is it okay to steal from someone? No. Is it okay to test, is it okay to say, is it okay to lie? No. She would know that. Now if I said honor your father and mother, I probably wouldn't ask her that question because who knows where that would go. But even an eight-year-old can see these commandments, see these things that we're not supposed to do, and say, yeah, we're not supposed to do those. Now, is it because she knows the 613 laws of the Old Testament? No, because I don't know all 613 laws of the Old Testament. I don't know if most of the Jewish people of this time knew all 613 laws. Now, I know they all had it memorized and everything else, but we all forget things that we're supposed to have memorized, don't we? And he says, I've obeyed these commandments since I was young. Well, good. You've done 90% of what everybody else has, has done. Like, most people haven't murdered. Most people haven't committed adultery. Most people don't go around lying all the time. Most people don't do these things. Looking at the man, Je- Jesus felt genuine love. And so this line here shows me that this man is truthful. That this man has followed the commandments. This man has done everything in his power to live a holy, righteous life. And so Jesus felt love for him. There's still one thing you haven't done, he told him. Go and sell all your possessions. Give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. He tells this man to to sell everything. This is that one thing that you haven't done yet. Sell everything. Give it to the poor and then come follow me. So that means today after church, I want all of us to go home and sell everything we have and then come back here and then give all that money to the church. Oh, and then if you don't do that and you say you did that, then you'll be struck dead in the middle of the sanctuary next week. Right? Because that's how it was in the, the Old Testament there. No, that's not, or that's what was done in Acts. That's not what this means. Once again, this is very specific to this rich, young ruler. Just as it was specific to the three men we met before this. Jesus knew that this man was living righteously, that this man was living holy, that this man had a heart for God, and yet what was keeping him was his stuff. Was his stuff. Sometimes it's our stuff that gets in the way. Sometimes it's that, oh, well, I can get a new car, so I, I should get a new car. It's kind of funny. We were picking on, on my sister's fiance last night, Kevin, 
about his phone. He's one of those guys that has to have the newest phone. And so the newest iPhone just came out, and it's really bugging him that he doesn't have the newest iPhone with the titanium wrapped around it and you know, all these new features that are the same for the last seven years. They're, they're not new. They just recall them something different, so it sounds new. It's the same phone. It just got shiny stuff on the outside, so it looks newer. That's a different story for another time. But we can get that same way. Oh, well, this new car came out, and it, it does this and this and this. And we were talking about this this morning. We don't, we don't really want robots in our cars to keep us in a straight line. or, you know, We've seen how that movie ends. Because no movie with robot ends, ends good. It's just the way it is. But oftentimes we can look to our neighbors and see, oh, well, they have this, so I want to I have that. Our neighbors have really nice manicured lawns, so I want that. I mean, I do want that, but I also, I also have a life and have things I have to do, so I don't get always to get to manicure the lawn the way I want to. I also have a lawnmower that's like eight years old and a rusted out deck on it, and it's falling apart. But that's a different story altogether, too. Sometimes we can get so wrapped up in the things that we have or the things that we don't have that those things become our God. Our things can become our God. The things that we have, the things that we want to have. Because I often think that, especially for me, it's better the things I want that I don't have. Because I can get really wrapped up in the things that I don't have. Like, I think when Chris and I first met, I had over 30 baseball caps. Like, for me, baseball caps are kind of a, kind of a thing. Like, I will wear a different one almost every day of the week. I can become wrapped up in that. When I first met Krista, I had, like, six pairs of tennis shoes. Well, I only have two pairs of, well, I have one pair of feet. I have two feet. I don't need six pairs of shoes for my one pair of feet. But I was wrapped up in that. I used to be really into, well, I still am into video games, but I used to be really into video games. I now only have, like, three video games compared to the 30-some that I used to have. Now, I'm not here to say that I'm better. It's just because I'm poor and have no money, so I can't afford those things anymore, too, which is also a good thing. Notice how it turns from the surplus of having things is the downfall. When all of a sudden I don't have that surplus, I don't have the money to promote those means of things, I have the money that we need. I can now pay for food. I can now pay for electricity. I can now pay for our gas. I can now pay for the things that we need rather than the things that we don't need that preoccupy my time. Now, I'm not saying that we should all be poor because some of us are called to have money because some of us can handle money. Those who can handle money Maybe I need to become better friends with you all. <laughs> but there are certain people who are called to handle money so that they can bless other people with what they've been blessed with. Now, Chris and I, we know that one day when we're ready for it, when we've been faithful enough with what we have, we will be blessed with more because it's always been that way. We learned very early on in our relationship that we had more than we needed. And then we moved to Berlin. Nobody should move to Berlin. Nobody should, nobody should do that. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? This amazed them. But Jesus said again, dear children, it is very hard to enter the kingdom of God. In fact, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. I want to change the wording of this from rich because oftentimes we can, we can twist these words of rich. What does it even mean to be rich? Because oftentimes we can think, oh, well, I don't make that much money, so I'm not rich, so I can enter the kingdom of God. Or I'm a preacher with my wife being a teacher, and so we'll enter the God, kingdom of God easily because we're just a preacher and a teacher. Let me change the word rich to prideful. Or to the proud. And then let me read it again. How hard is it for the proud to enter the kingdom of God? This amazed them. But Jesus said again, Dear children, it is very hard to enter the kingdom of God. In fact, it is easier for a, ca for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a proud person to enter the kingdom of God. 
when we read it like that, all of us then should kind of feel something there because there's all something that we're all proud about. There's always something that, that eats at us, that tries to pull us away from God. Or something that we've done in this life that we can say, I did that. We haven't done anything. We've just been blessed by God to have the opportunity to do things. And I want to point this out. When we talk about the eye of a needle, this isn't this huge, like, eight-foot tall, I won't even jump that, eight-foot tall camel through this little, I was going to bring a needle in, but I left it at home, through this little tiny eye of a needle. That's not what we're talking about, because that, that's impossible. Hopefully we know that's impossible. And it's not even talking about the camel fur through the eye of a needle either. It's talking about one of the gates into the city of Jerusalem where Jesus was speaking at this time. In order for the camel to get through this little gate that was only about this tall, the camel had to be stripped of everything. Everything the camel was carrying had to be taken off of the camel. Everything that we are carrying in this life, can we allow ourselves to be stripped of it? What if we had nothing? Let me ask this question. Do we follow God because of the things he has given us or do we follow God because of who he is? Let me say that one more time. Do we follow God because of the things he has blessed us with or because of who he is? If we had absolutely nothing, if we had simply the clothes on our back and nothing else, would we still be here this morning? Would we still praise God the same way? The camel had to be completely stripped of everything and then the camel had to get down onto its knees. I don't know if you've seen a camel's knees before, but I don't think they're the most supportive thing in the whole world. But the camel had to humble itself. An animal that's almost as stubborn as, as donkeys are had to get down on its knees and then shuffle its way through. How often do we have to humble ourselves, strip everything else off of ourselves, humble ourselves, get down on our knees and shuffle through life? in order to enter into the kingdom of God. Strip everything away. Humble ourselves. And that is how we enter the kingdom of God. That's what Jesus is saying here this morning. We go on to verse 26. And the disciples were astounded. Then who in the world can be saved? Jesus looked at them intently and said, humanly speaking, it is impossible. Humanly speaking, you on your own cannot do it. You with all of your things, you with all of your humanity, you with all of your pride, you with all of your stuff cannot do it. But what's it say at the end there? But not with God. With God, everything is possible. With God, everything is possible. We'll have our time of invitation this morning. And I want you to focus on two things this morning. What has your faith cost you? Has it cost you anything? Or are you simply living by faith or are you playing faith? Because if we're going to grow... Like, I know this church, this congregation can grow, not only individually, but together and as a community as well. We have to realize that there's a difference between religion and faith. And we have to realize what that difference is. What's holding us back from reaching that? Is there something that Jesus is calling us to that we don't want to let go of? That's the question this morning. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you. I thank you for you. I thank you for who you are because I feel like we can forget the amazing power and the amazingness that is just you. That we know that one day, if we just, if we just keep doing things the right way, if we just stay safe and we stay stay in our own little bubble that, that maybe we'll reach heaven. And we tend to just push that off. 
But Lord, what if we lived each day as if heaven is tomorrow? That heaven is just a breath away. How would that change our life? How would that change how we act? How would it change if we interact with each other, but how we interact with you? Lord, I pray that we learn to seek you this morning. That we strip everything away. And when it comes down to it, is it the things of this life or is it you, Lord? I pray that we seek that question this morning. I pray we seek who you are and what you have planned for us. Not only individually, but as a congregation and as a community. Lord, be with us this morning as we search. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.